Grant Productions presents Brass, the audio series, episode 25, Troubling Times. It is the year 1886, but not one that's familiar to you. Four months have passed since our last visit, and much has changed. There is a new prime minister and a new party in power, and the transformation that they have effected upon Britain has come at a bewildering pace. Up to now, this very different empire, a creation of colonial theorists, technocratic evangelists, and some very fortunate historical circumstances, has enjoyed a golden age of art and technology, as well as enlightened and compassionate policies and politics. But now, it seems, this brilliance has lost its luster, and a darkness like a pea-soup fog grows outwards from the capital. For those outside London, it seems as though the glorious rays of a mighty empire are in eclipse and England stands increasingly alone. Indeed, less than 500 miles to the north has grown a barrier of fear and distrust between two countries long allied. There is a somber and oppressed look to the Aberdeen train station, with uniformed soldiers stationed at each platform, watching the passengers embarking and arriving. From out of the 343 Highland Gypsy from London comes a slender woman wearing a tweedy jacket and pince-nez. After a moment's halting efforts, she first undertips, then overtips the porter before grabbing her valise and making her way awkwardly towards the turnstile. Papers, please. Of course. Miss Townsend Trelawney. Miss, that is myself. Reason for your travel. I am a writer for the press and journal and have been covering politics in the capital. What sort of politics? Trade, specialising in tariffs. It's quite interesting, really. You see, England is suffering from a trade imbalance, what you might call a trade deficit, in which certain key goods, including coal tar derivatives, rubber tree sap and aluminium, are far too dear for our merchants necessitating an adjustment of purchasing power for such goods. All right. I've some monographs if you're interested in further reading. I'm not. On your way. As she heads towards the entrance to the street, an older woman, dressed in black with the rigid carriage of a lifetime in service, begins to walk in step with her. Welcome to Scotland, Mum. Mrs. Trigg. Is that all your luggage? I left the remainder with relations in Kent. I did not know you had relations in Kent, Mum. It is not a particularly noteworthy item, Drake. Anything regarding your family is of particular note to me, Mum. Especially during this somewhat trying time. A cab, Drake. The driver can be trusted. Afternoon, Mum. <coughs> Millicent. How lovely to see you, my dear. And are you? We were so awfully relieved to hear that. Not you... in public, Millicent. Sorry, Mum. To the rendezvous. At once. Lovely seeing Millicent. She was one of the first back. How is the staff getting on? Reassembled and hard at work, Mum. Betrayal in our ranks shook us. But standing alongside each other in battle brought out our best. I am glad to hear it. How many have hastened to your call? All of them, ma'am. All of them? You're the last to arrive. Susan and Cook came in last night. That's quite a retention rate among household staff, Drake. Particularly six months after our house was blown up. You are assured of our loyalty, ma'am. Despite a delay in wages... There's not a man nor woman on staff who wouldn't follow you with little thought of wages. For that, you may take credit as their leader, Drake. I prefer the title housekeeper, ma'am. Even if the house I was keeping, regrettably, did not survive our recent troubles. Any word from Lord Brass, might I ask? He and Cyril, as well as Lord Whitestone and others, have begun preparations for the summit. While their eastern operative has opened negotiations with Prince Dakar... They're Eastern operatives. Do you remember Avanel Qatar? The Islamic gentleman who we met during that affair, the Assassins? The very one. He was quite helpful. Yes. As I recall, he even managed to kill three of the Assassins that you didn't get to first. It was two, I believe. He is meeting with Prince Dakar. Do you think there's any chance that he will join the effort? Uh, Who knows? 
I would hope Lord Brass would be keeping you apprised of such developments. Mrs. Drake, in practically every way that matters, I am my husband's intellectual superior. Yet I tip my hat to his capacity for keeping so many moving pieces in his head at one time. You two are perfectly matched, if you don't mind me saying. At least we both have the intelligence to engage you. We would be dead a dozen times over if not for that. It's been a pleasure. Any luck on your London expedition? Regrettably, no. I was able to successfully impersonate a middling civil servant and gain access to any number of files to check on our traitor. It is as you said. Not only had Danny received clearance from a prestige service, but he had been formally vetted by Whitehall. As far as I could tell, he had no criminal record or terrorist affiliation. A remarkably tentative response, if you don't mind me saying, ma'am. Drake, the bureaucracy of our empire's government is so labyrinthine as to challenge me to the utmost. How have we risen to our prominence as a nation through such a chaotic half-amalgam of illogical systems? I would like to think it was through the qualities of our national character. Any word from Miss Gwendolyn? She believes she has means on getting into a meeting with this crime minister. I've told her that she needs to wait for proper clearance to do so from her father. And what do you think the likelihood of that? Slim to none. She is my daughter. How are the accommodations? Adequate, madam. Or nearly so. Oh, dear. I had not realized that the current laird of the estate had let it go somewhat. Second cousins are so very unreliable. The genetics are just potluck. We'll make do. Clarissa and Gordon have finished installing some bunks in the loft of the barn, and Stevie is constructing a shed for use as an armory. How is dear Stevie? Right as rust. Most anxious to have news of Master Cyril. I'll make sure to speak with him on our arrival. Are you sure the staff can hold on for another week at reduced wages? Positive. The coastal project, ma'am? Indeed. Constructing a velodrome has proven to be rather more expensive than I had envisioned. And complicated? And complicated. Fortunately, the Laird of Cove Bay asked no questions when we purchased the land adjacent to his farm and had him apply for the permits. You know, Drake, you've never asked why we are building a racing track for bicycles. Like yourself, ma'am. I cannot always follow all the subtle strategies of your husband's mind, even as I follow him into battle. And speaking of which, a disturbing report, ma'am, via Millicent. What is it, Millicent? Two days ago, we had an update from our man in the palace. As you know, the royal consort has been ill. Has he taken a turn for the worse? No, Mum. And it does seem to be little more than a grip. But the royals have made an unexpected trip up to Balmoral. Why unexpected? Don't they come up to the estate on a regular basis? They do, but not when one of them is prescribed bed rest. Fair point. What else? I had a chat with the housekeeper from Balmoral. I wasn't aware you knew her. We housekeepers have our own network of communication, Mum. Of course you do. Go on. She reports a platoon of soldiers have been newly stationed there, and not of a particularly gracious or elite class. When did the royals arrive? Yesterday, Mum. I had Gordon on duty at the station to watch and give a report. On the train with the Queen and Royal Consort, a dozen or so travelling staff and a company of approximately 120 armed military escort. They proceeded directly to Balmoral via coach. Any idea of how many of the escort were palace guard? No more than 20, Mum. That's not good. Protocol is to have at least twice that many, and as for military escort... Are you drawing a similar conclusion to my own, Mum? If it is that the Queen and Royal Consort are to be held captive at their own Scottish estate, then yes. What are we to do? Ladies, we must remember that our principal mission is the completion of the velodrome. But the royals are imprisoned! Perhaps, but confinement to one's quarters is less of a burden when your quarters are a moderately sized castle. A castle that's less than 50 miles from here. A fair point, Drake. We need a plan. Once things start to move, they will move very soon, and they shall move very quickly. 
Our opponent has pieces all over the board, so it makes sense to take at least two away from him before he knows what's up. How do you communicate with the housekeeper at the estate? Private messenger. And telegraph when needs be. Still no telephone installed yet at Balmoral, then. Ah. Then, this is what you must tell her. Back in London... Though the March air has lost the cold of winter, the wind that blows is full of grit and a grey feeling of fear. A gust slams the shutters on the large bay windows of a cosy flat on Clacker Street, the home of one Ponder Wright, otherwise known as the mechanical detective. Today Ponder is meeting not with a client, but a friend, a large man with a boxer's physique and thick black hair running down to his shoulders. that's the last of the Earl Grey, Dan, so if you'd like a second cup, I've got little idea what colour or flavour is left in the tea caddy. <laughs> no need for such foraging, Ponder. How goes the detecting business? To be honest, my friend, not well. As someone who works to uphold the law, it's devilish hard to do so when those who are supposed to govern show as little interest in its enforcement. Our capital is today a veritable den of thieves. And worse, my friend. Ever since the election of that horrible man, Trent, it feels that the very moral compass of our nation has been in free motion. How are things in your community? In a word, bad. And when a Jew tells you things are bad, you should take him at his word. You are speaking of the new laws regarding the right to assembly. Those and others. The new press laws, the resident alien legislation. I have even heard tell of a loyalty oath required of all my faith to the state or we risk deportation. That is tremendously worrying. I was born in this city. My people have been part of the woven tapestry of London life since the time of Cromwell. I am a proud Englishman, and I am a proud Jew. Those who seek to test my loyalty to my country over my faith make me ashamed to count them as my countrymen. I heard tell of some disturbances in Bethnal Green. You heard right. I was leading them. Really? A week ago, a gang of young thugs followed a rabbi from his synagogue and beat him half to death. Then they made the very poor choice of returning to our neighborhood. And thus the disturbance. I prefer to think of it as a lesson in the fine pedigree of pugilism among the Jews of London. Since the days of Daniel Mendoza, we have valued knowing how to use our fists. Are you still teaching at your gymnasium? It's a living. Or well, it was, up till all of this. Now, my friend, it is a calling. The young men and women I teach the fine art of bare-fisted boxing to are not just students. They are the first platoon of an army. Too often in the past, my people have depended on their Christian neighbors to come to their aid when the bad times came. We shall not make such a mistake again. Can't say I blame you, Dan. To see the quality of men evoking my faith these days makes me glad at least half of me is firmly agnostic. If there's anything I can do to help... <laughs> when the hero of the Battle of Babbage Street offers you help, you don't refuse. Come talk to my students next week. I shall. They could use a good war story. Particularly one from a hero, not a villain. Excuse me a moment, Dan. Oh, not at all. Ah, Fonda. Ah, I see you have company. Yes, if you don't mind. No, please, come in. Dan Abraham. Clover's worth, child. I've employed Mr. Wright to pursue a particular matter involving a family legacy. You could not ask for a better man for the job. So I believe. Mr. Abraham, are you a relation to the famed prize fighter? <laughs> I was the man before my retirement. I thought I detected a pugilist bill beneath your jacket. Are you a fighter yourself? That was some force to your handshake. Uh, me? No, not really. A bit of fencing in my youth. I have often heard the pugilist art described as fencing with fists. Is that so? It is. If you should ever decide to see what that might be about, come see me at my gymnasium. We offer capable instruction at an affordable price. Thank you, Mr. Abraham. Thank you, Mr. Rothschild. Ponder, my very best. I shall expect you, shall we say, Wednesday at six? I shall be delighted. Take care, dear friend. 
So that was Dan Abraham. A fine Englishman and a formidable fighter. A bit shorter than I'd imagined. Oh. But a great deal better looking. My God, Ponder. How can a man keep such a handsome face in such a brutal sport? By being very good. Oh, I wish I'd seen him fight. Oh, it's worth the price of admission. Retired, he says. How old could he be? I'll guess him to be around 34. Now, Mr. Worthchild, to what do I owe this visit? Ah, I've come to get and give some intelligence. Mind if I lock the door? I insist upon it. Now, what do you want to know? Aside from where you've been hiding Mr. Abraham... He spends most of his time in the East End, doing his best to safeguard a people who have been feeling unwelcome in their own city. <sighs> Part of the resistance? Is that what we're calling ourselves these days? Well, until I can call myself something different than Mr. Worthchild... Ugh, oh, excuse me, I must take this wig off. It gives me a headache. Perhaps a brandy and soda might help? Oh, just the brandy, thanks, Ponder. Yes, if you ever find you need a bit of extra muscle, you do worse than sinking it from Dan Abraham and his gymnasium. Then it may be soon that I'll have reason to look him up, because I think I've found the lead that I've been looking for. Go on. You recall that I've been trying to find a way to infiltrate one of these monthly meetings you've discovered. A lodge meeting, yes. Seems to be based upon a similar gathering of the Black Hand Organization of the Sicilians. And it offers a rare opportunity to meet this crime minister in person. But Gwendolyn, as I've told you, this meeting is only for London's crime bosses. You've little chance of infiltrating it without detection. So you might think. But I've got a lead on how to track down one of these bosses. And with a bit of luck, that'll be my ticket in. Which one? Kensington Gore, the leader of the footpads and pickpockets who infest the theatre. Yes, I've heard of him. Your brother and I witnessed a crime audition run by his protégé in Catsball, Mademoiselle Trasano, in an abandoned theatre. And this Trasano woman is precisely who I'm trying to find. Apparently she's moved from robbery and assault to much greater skullduggery. Which is? From rumour, she has become a theatrical producer and is looking for a venue for a new play. And that is a crime? Definitely. I've read the play. Tomorrow night, I'm going to visit a theatrical manager of my acquaintance, who I believe might be able to help me track down Trasano and through her, Gore. And when do you find Gore? I find myself a ticket. Do you need my assistance? This is an avenue that requires a more discreet approach, Ponder, than... A dashing sleuth with half his body given over to gaming metal. I understand. Besides, your father has already sent me my next mission, which he tells me is absolutely vital. Yes? I am charged with tracking down two of his scientist friends, Nikolai Tesla and Eric von Hoffmann. He says it's time to enlist their help. Are they still in England? So many foreigners have already left. He says he's fairly sure that they must be in London, most likely still working at the Ministry of Science. You plan to visit them there? First, I plan to visit my brother Mordecai, late the head of said ministry. I imagine he'll be able to get me in to see them without any trouble. What are you to say when you do? They are to be told that he's alive, and they must contact him as soon as possible through Tesla's method. Tesla's method? That's what he said. I assume that this has something to do with the strange voice I heard in my atomatomic ear on the afternoon of the Battle of Babbage Street. I believe so. Mr. Tesla and he were experimenting with a revolutionary form of wireless communication. Remarkable. Still, I hope its final form does not result in mysterious voices manifesting in my head. Now, shall we plan our next meeting? Shall we say in two days' time? Excellent. Well, I'd best be off. Oh, this accursed wig. Is it all straight? Impeccably so. Goodbye, Ponder. Farewell, Mr. Worthchild. <laughs> Excuse me, uh, uh, Mr. Worthchild. Oh, uh, Mr. Abraham. Yes. I hope you don't mind that I waited for you to leave Ponders. I, I wanted to give you my car. Well, that would be fine. But what would it be regarding? Your further acquaintance and any assistance I could give you. Why might I need your assistance? Because a young woman who is going about as a young man is possibly someone in trouble, and certainly someone I would be interested in spending more time with. Excuse me? Your handshake. As an ardent student of the noble science of pugilism, I am very good at judging the character of a person through a good judgment of their fist. Mine was too feminine. <laughs> it suggested an iron will, 
but a decidedly delicate sensitivity. Mr. Abraham, if you're the man I believe you to be, would you care to accompany me on an errand tomorrow evening? Could it possibly be dangerous? Absolutely. Of course, then. You're my sort of fellow, Mr. Abraham. And I expect that you're my sort of lady. A dangerous mission and a new ally? A rumor of the abduction of the Queen and Royal Consort? What does this all mean? Find out the answer to at least one of these questions when we next rejoin the adventures of the first family of the realm, Brass. Brass is manufactured by Battleground Productions and features Kate Cray as Lady Brass, Charles Leggett as Lord Brass, Catherine Grant Sutty as Gwendolyn Brass, and Jeremy Adams as Cyril Brass, with Larry Albert, Margie Bickman, Lisa Carswell, Yusuf L. Gindy, Nancy Fry, Ronnie Hill, Philip Keeman, John Longenbar, Matt Middleton, Terry Edward Moore, Tad Morgan, and Nikki Vissel. Brass was recorded at Seattle Voice Academy, engineered by Shana Pennington Bard and Chris Lea, with sound designed by Kirsty Gilmore and music composed by Bruce Monroe. It was written and directed by John Longenbar. For more information on Brass, go to battlegroundproductions.org, find us on Facebook and Instagram, and to support us, fund us on Patreon, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. <laughs>